good deal. What's well, up, like slime it. lovers? I'm your host, Chris. This is my uh, tonight. Our special guest is Bobby Wynn. Over the top of him, over there somewhere, <laughs> Mr. Jamie Dunn. He's down in Alabama getting ready for a tackle show. Uh, want to thank Bobby for coming in. Want to thank Jamie for making it. <laughs> <laughs> for making it. <laughs> thank you for having me, man. I, I I'm honored. I, I really am. Good to have you, brother. It's, it's yeah. going to be a fun show. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, where the industry is going, uh, unity, how things have changed, probably uh, just the sheer growth of the catfish industry, uh, and then some networking, and then we're going to talk fishing. So I can't wait. Jamie? What are you down in Alabama for? Let's tell the people what you're down in Alabama for. Myself and Rebecca, we're down here for a uh, three-day show uh, at the Alabama um, Fishing Expo. So we are down here. Um, and where is we do. How, where's, where's the Fishing Expo this year? Uh, it's in Ga Gaston, Gaston uh, Alabama. So we're all set up. We got to go back tomorrow, finish setting up everything, and uh, it's Starts Friday and it ends on Sunday afternoon, I believe around five. All right. That's awesome. Yep. So guys, if y'all think T Jamie looks tired, it's because he's tired. <laughs> <laughs> he's on two hours of sleep, but uh he's here. So appreciate you coming in, buddy. Anytime, brother. That's what we're here for. We're going to have a good time tonight. Let's run down the list. We got chaos in the house. What's up, guys? We got Danimals Creation says almost first. What's up, Dan? How you doing, buddy? We got Michael Letty. What's up, Michael? We got Team Lad Catfishing. I believe that's Brian Lad. What's up, brother? I'm uh, I'm liking the graph setup you boys got going on today. So, congrats. That's going to be a game changer. We got Derek from Operation Vets with Nets. Derek, want to get you on soon, buddy. I'd like to get you on here and, and do some talking about Operation Vets with Nets. So we got Paul's story. Paul, appreciate the package, brother. I uh, I was meaning to bring that in here and give you a plug, but Paul sent me an air freshener for the truck just, uh, just to be nice. Uh, Paul's got a small business that makes – custom air fresheners i wish i had it in here i'd planned on bringing it in here but uh paul drop your uh the name of your your uh side business or your business in the chat so guys will know you can drop your website too buddy uh i wish i'd have been prepared and had that but appreciate that and uh we got polar bear chad chad it's been a long time buddy where yeah, you been? We got Jerry Parker, JP. What's up, bro? We got Richard Gadget Green. Richard's been missing. Hope everything's good with Richard. Bobby's out of here. Same problem we had last week. No, I, I'm, I'm trying to. I don't know what happened. All right. You got. Right, you must be, there you we're go. Back. We got uh, Eagle Eyes TN to another Operation Vets with Nets guy. He's the Texas chapter uh the head of the texas chapter of the captains i don't know what your position is but welcome in bro facebook user i don't have facebook up i can't see who you guys are but thanks for stopping in boys we got jeff gordon welcome in jeff missed you last week i think chuck watkins mr bite lights yes, sir. What's, up, chuck? what's up brother it's warming up, so I should be putting those new bite lights to use soon, bro. Appreciate appreciate those. I'll uh, be showing off some nighttime planer boarding picks. We got Kevin Walters. I got Kevin committed. He's coming on the show in two weeks. That's awesome. What's up, Kevin? Next week, we got Anthony Brown. That'll be a good show. Yeah. Uh, Micah Burkhart, King of Tennessee. What's up, buddy? Welcome in. We got uh, Russell Rhodes, Carolina Lake Weights boy. What's up, Russell? Says, what's up, guys? Got the strep throat goo and trying to get better. So, yeah, I saw you. You had you were down. So, hopefully that doesn't knock you down too far, Russell. 
Brandon Outdoor Adventures. Welcome in, Brandon. And Richard Green. Well, I guess you changed accounts, Richard. We got Helen's Vlog. Welcome in, Helen. We got Off the Hook Outdoors. Welcome in, Ted. Ted, need to get you on the show, man. You'd make a great guest. We got JTC, Jeremy Tournament Cats. He's What's one up? of our Carolina Lakeweights teammates. We got Indiana Chris Usselton. Welcome in, Chris. Moving on down, moving on down. We got Big John's Catfishing. Welcome in, buddy. So, Bobby, most everybody probably knows who you are. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and uh, we'll just get this party ro rolling. Absolutely. Uh, I want to start off again by saying thank you guys for having me. Um, I, we're going to have a lot of fun on here today, and, and I'm really excited to uh, share some knowledge, gain some knowledge, and, and, and have a lot of laughs. But um, obviously, I'm Bobby Wynn. Um, I predominantly fish the Kerr Lake area and, you know, sometimes the James River, but I'm from North Carolina, um, near the Greensboro area. And, um, I grew up, I started off cat, uh, channel cat fishing. I grew up catching some big channel cats and, um, eventually, um, got into the, uh, you know, bigger waters and, and have making a lot of new friends that, uh, obviously have uh, generously, um, you know, allowed me to jump on with them and, and learn from them and really, um, you know, just get to where I'm at today. You know, everything, I, I attribute everything that, that I've got going for me today, obviously to, to everybody in the industry who has, um, you know, been out here to support me and, and teach me and, and, you know, people like you guys for just being genuinely good people and, um, always willing to support people, but that other than that, I'm a pretty basic guy, pretty regular dude. I think you're a good dude everywhere. I, everywhere that uh, anyone ever says anything about you, it's always positive. So we hit it off good. I, you know, I respect what you do. I've been following you, you know, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. A lot of similarities between a lot of the guys we have on. We all have the same passion for catfishing. Uh, so it seems like there's a lot of commonality between all of us guys that are in this thing really heavy. So absolutely. Uh, I'll start it off and say that I, I think what you said is probably pretty fairly new to the game where, uh, I think guys helping each other is probably really taken off more in the last six, seven years. Before that, it was real closed off. You you couldn't get information. Guys were hiding their rigs when they would come in from tournaments. They would hide their the, – the guides really didn't want to show everybody all the secrets. They kind of kept everything uh, tight-lipped. But I've noticed, like you said – you can attribute attribute a lot of this knowledge to guys helping you. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that that's probably one of the biggest things that's changed. Uh, how long have you been catfishing? So I, I started off as a bass fisherman growing up. Um, and I, then I moved into channel cats. I started fishing a lake near my house called Lake Higgins, you know, pier fishing out there and, there's no blues or flatheads in that lake. So, you know, the apex predators, the channel cats. So I grew up catching 12 to 18 pound channel cats. You know, those are pretty, big channel cats, for, yeah, yeah. especially for yeah. Texas. So what do you use for bait for a 12 to 18 pound channel cat? Cut so, bait? Yeah. So one thing that, you know, everybody, a lot of people, you know, when people have caught some big, big ones out there on, I mean, I watched somebody catch a 14 pounder off that pier um on a marshmallow but I, generally what you what i what i've noticed is that your smaller ones your smaller channel cats i mean i've caught I've caught those on everything from soap corn to you know bread and worms and anything under the sun they're gonna eat it but your bigger ones generally you know i i just take everything that i do when i'm 
like from a blue cat standpoint, you know, your big shad, shad is be smaller chunks for it. So I, 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 de I definitely think that like any fish, you know, the bigger ones are going to be smarter. And I've noticed that the more natural you can get and the more natural presentation, the more fresh bait you can get, the higher your chances are of enticing that big channel cat to bite. I think, you know, it, 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 as far as most catfish species go that we have here, most of them start out as scavengers uh, mm -hmm. and they move up. And when they hit a certain size, they start going after live prey. Right. You know, there's not a whole lot of dead stuff floating around unless you're having like striper feeding or something like that or a rain where there's a bunch of stuff flushed into the lake. You might have big fish start to scavenge, and, uh, you know, but it's a big channel cat. He's a predator. Mm -hmm. He's eating, you know, he's generally eating a live fish most of the time. Oh, yeah. I don't know what it's, what weight they decide they're going to start moving off from that, but blue cats are scavengers when they're small too. Right. Oh, yeah. And, and I think, like, one thing that I've noticed is, like, around here anyway, and, and, you know, I grew up saying, you know, a double-digit channel cat is a, is a pretty good fish. You know, they start getting into that 10-pound range, and generally that's where I've seen them being start really getting picked. Yeah, they look a lot different when they yeah. become, they're just meaty, bulby looking like fat, everything on them's just a little bit different. Right. I think that's the biggest difference between a channel cat and a blue cat is like a channel cat, as much as people think that they're the skinnier ones, a real big channel cat is going to grow girth more than it's going to grow length. Yeah, I've noticed once they get about 10 pounds, they start looking more short and stubby. Right. Uh, ones exactly. I, we can, uh, I, 10 pounds is the high end for most of our lakes in Texas. Um, if you catch one up, you know, in the mid teens or I, the biggest one I ever caught is 19 pounds. And my, my buddy's big... like, damn, that's almost a state record. I'm like, no, uh, not close, but uh, – it is a lake record for a lot of lakes around here. I don't know why they don't get big, but there's a million one to two pounders. Uh, and our guys all use like punch bait. Yeah. Catch them. Cheese bait. Yeah. Like you can catch like a lot of people. I think a channel cat is a very underrated fish to target. I mean, just from a sheer size standpoint, right? If I'm They gonna... fight hard, a lot harder than a blue cat. Pound for they pound. do a lot of tricks and runs yeah. and yes they're fun they're a lot of fun man and and if you find bodies of water like that's one thing i've noticed is you, like okay my first catfish ever at bugs was a 12 pound channel but aside from that you know i, I haven't read you don't really see a lot of your double digit plus pound channel cats in bodies of water that have a healthy population of blues and or flatheads just because from a size to sheer size standpoint, they're no longer the apex predator. But if you get a body of water that doesn't have blues or flatheads where that channel cat can become that apex predator, you're going to see a lot bigger channel cats on an app, you know, from an average size stamp. So why, why, for instance, there's a million channel cats in Texas. We have an endless supply of bait in our lakes. I mean, we have, it's just, you can't go 20 feet without seeing shad. And so why don't our channel cats get big? So I think in those same bodies of water, I, again, I think it, it genuinely, I genuinely believe that like there's going to be big ones in there, yeah. but they're no longer the apex predator in, in, in somewhere where, because if you look at it, if there's blues and flatheads in that same body of water, that channel cat is now competing. He's actually prey. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. A, a, a five-pound channel cat, a 40-pound flathead is going to scoop that thing up and not think twice about it. Yeah, and a blue cat, too. My buddy Milton, yeah. he's a guy. He's like, man, I'm cutting these blue cats open. They're, they're just full of catfish. Yeah. So they eat catfish. I'm like, yeah, they eat any. They're creatures of opportunity. Uh, right. They will eat alive anything that's in front of them if they want it. Yeah, I think that's just what it comes down to is, is 
the biggest fish in the body of water is generally going to be, you know, the biggest apex predator, I'll say, in a body of water generally is going to be, is going to grow to be the biggest other than carp, which, you know, because they can biologically eat, you know, two times their body weight in a day as they're growing up. But when you look at like a predator, like you look at like the great white, like in the ocean, they get, they're one of the biggest predatory sharks, if not the biggest predatory sharks. And, and, but they're the apex predator. So they get that big. If you look at like an amberjack or or a tuna, which tuna get big, but not as big as a great white. Yeah. They can still get big. But I think when you start looking at who is the king of that body of water, where it fears little to nothing, that's where your size differential is going to come in. So I would just think that with as many damn channel cats as we have in Texas, they would get bigger. I, 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 our record's like 38 pounds or something. It's caught in the 50s. You know, they caught a 52 two years ago. They thought it was, oh, we got this 52-pound channel cat. Well, they did the DNA test. It was a it was a hybrid. A, a blue cat. Hybrid cat, blue, cat. Half blue cat. Yeah. It had the rays. It had the fins. But the DNA test said it was 50% blue cat. So I'd be curious. that The Santee record, that, that 58, that they caught out of Santee Cooper years ago. I would be curious. It looks like a channel cat to me in the picture. Yeah, but the other the, this 51 or 52 caught it to walk and he looked like a channel cat too. Right. And I don't think that the DNA was very... They I mean, didn't have really, a DNA test back right. then when so that came. So I would be curious. Now, I will say this. There were no blue cats in Santee Cooper at the time. Yes. At, at yes. that time. Yes. There so, were no, or there, there might, you know, there, the there world could be. be. The world <laughs> might never know. If yeah. I had to bet and that record restarted, I would say the Red River would would produce it. Because I see a lot, I wouldn't say a lot. There's nowhere in the world that produces a lot of 30-pound channels. But you see a fairly consistent number of 30 to 40-pound channel cats that come out of the Red River, but you don't see a lot of blue cats out of there, if any. It'd be it'd be it'd be a sight. Richard Green says his grandson caught a two pound bass today. I, I said I said cut it up for bait. Love it, <laughs> love it. I like oh, those lines. goodness. You're gonna make these t- bass anglers mad at us, man. <laughs> That's supposed to be a secret. <laughs> okay, Bobby. What what caused you to go from bass fishing to cat fishing, brother? I think it was the challenge. So there was a guy that was on that pier. I actually started off on that pier with lures, bass fishing, you know, just trying to catch some spawning bass that would come in the springtime. And there was a guy out there, and, and I, I, I attribute my love, my start on cat fishing to him. His name was Z. I can't pronounce his name. He, he's Turkish, but greatest guy, one of the greatest people I've ever met, and he dealt with little old me asking a million questions to try and learn how to catfish. But um, he let me reel in, I think it was like a 14-pound channel cat. And the power of that thing was like, listen, like I've caught 11 bass in my life over 10, 12 now. And the sheer power of that 14-pound channel cat like when it started digging right there at the pier, like, and you're just like, you know, yeah, getting whooped. I was like, man, this is, this is what it's about. That's a challenge for me. And with the bath, your only challenge is just hope they don't jump. That's it. Trying to hold and them just, That's, and it was bigger, right? You, you see 10 to 15 pound channel cats with pretty regular consistency out there. I cannot say the same for a bass. So I think it was just the next big thing and the next challenge for me. And I realized that with a large mouth, you're pretty limited as to the size there. And and when you really start getting the feeling of a big catfish get doing that catfish dig, I was mm-hmm. like, oh, selling all my bass stuff. <laughs> That's it. Don't take but one time. There you go. That's it. It's something about going after that apex predator that's cool. Oh, yeah. You know, 
Oh yeah. I mean, whatever body of water it is. Now, not everybody's got giant fish, but right. you know, in their water, a twenty's big. And if you're not used to catching twenties, I got buddies like, oh my god, I got a forty pounder on here. Come bring your scale. I'm like, <laughs> I love it. Oh, See, man. I love it though because. You know, that's the way I look at things is, and I think fishing like the bodies of water, like I know you guys can probably attest to it, but like I live, I live really close to the James river and, and bugs Island, which I'm at pretty regularly where you get spoiled a lot of times. And yeah, that's a great lake. It's got super sized fish. I don't know how all of a sudden they just came out of nowhere and started producing hundred pound fish. I think it's, I think it's been going on. Yeah. yeah. I think it's just as catfishing has become more popular. I think what it was was back in the day, which I've seen pictures from back in the day. You know what I mean? People showing me pictures, like actual pictures of some giant fish, you know, 100 plus pound class fish. But back then, all people caught them for was to eat them. And you're not really going to be. And that was, again, before the age of social media. Yeah. People, so, like, people when didn't I was care a kid, about Texas was the king of catfish states. Yeah. You know, now it's guys have no idea what lake I'm fit. They're like, it's just completely off the radar, other than right. like Texoma. And if you're a tournament guy, everybody's probably heard of Lake Tawakini. Right. Uh, but uh, as far as the catfish in our state, we have been surpassed by so many states it's crazy you know but 20 years ago texas was king Uh, yeah i I just it's weird to me that like south carolina okay that that's kind of the mecca of where it all started uh, as far as popularity and how we all fish today started in south carolina but back then texas had bigger fish uh, right and now here we are 25 years later, Virginia's king. Now all the big fish are still coming out of the East. It's yeah. But well, you guys was- have been fishing like that for a long time. And a lot of our techniques come from saltwater fishing. I believe that's mm-hmm. South Carolina that brought yeah. the guys from the coast. They're like, you guys are catching these giant fish. Why don't you try fishing like us guys that saltwater fish for so long? Uh, right. And it, it's transitioned well. Most of my rigs and how I fish is saltwater oriented now. Yeah, yeah, the fish finder rig. You've got your fish finder rig and your Santee rig are the two predominant rigs that people use when you're catfishing. Yeah, and the hooks are more of a saltwater style hook, even though it rots off. Uh, and just the way you rig with the, a snell hook and uh, a snell knot, I mean, you know. I think at the end of the day, when you're talking about fishing with cut bait on the bottom, whether it's shark fishing, stingray fishing, drum fishing, cat fishing, you know, whatever it is, you know, I think there's similarities where generally you want that bait on the bottom and yeah. you want a bloody piece of bait on the bottom. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to say it, 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 it's not complicated because there's other aspects of it that je- definitely can get a little you know, when you start talking about drifting and all that, but I think when you think about the general gist of it, you want the bait somewhere near the bottom, generally, and you want a bloody piece of bait on a hook on the bottom. Yeah. I think that, you know, no matter if you're in fresh or salt water and, and shark fishing or cat fishing, you know, there's, there's not a lot of, you know, it, it's not complicated. It's not rocket science, is I guess the the gist of it. Yeah. Kevin said last trip to Sandusky, boy, we caught over 150 channel cat between 12 and 30 pounds. And, and I you, gotta say that's had a heck of a more time. fun than, than <laughs> blue catting on a on a big on a really good day <laughs> down here in Texas. At, Man, in the I'll winter. take a 15 pound channel cat. So like my my PB channel is 22 eight. He said it was the most fun he's ever had catfishing. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, you hook into a 15-pound channel cat, you're going to have drag pulling 
I don't care what reel you're using. That he's gonna be pulling some drag. He said he yeah. caught him up to thirty. So there's a lot of thirties that come out of that Sandusky. I've heard of Sand. I've heard Sandusky does produce some some big chans, some real big chans. But I think channel cats are overrated because again, people, if they're gonna put the time into catfish, I feel like a lot of people are looking for the next in a very literal sense, right? The next biggest right. thing. Plus, you know, there's something about the total, the size of the fish that's right. uh, cool to brag about. I think that's a big part of catfishing is, oh, you know, everybody asks, what's your PB? And when we're all fishing on the boat, I, I love giving guys the PB. It feels good to get one. Right. Oh, and you yeah. remember it forever. I mean, how many 20, 30, 40s, 50s you caught? Uh, you don't remember all of them, but no. you damn sure remember <laughs> those apex fish of your size, you know, the size of the ones you catch. Uh, I think giving that feeling to guys is probably one of the coolest things in catfishing for me. I love it. So my one of my biggest moments, well, I've got, you know, obviously the, the kids, seeing the kids even catch big channels like that, you know, but I had a buddy of mine one day and he called me up and I was feeling pretty under the weather from the night before. Um, and he called me, he said, look, I want to take the boat out. Let's go to bugs. Like I want to learn. He's a crappy fisherman by nature. He said, I just bought this new war Eagle and it came with all these hell cats and rod holders. And I want to learn how to catfish. And I say, he said, my PB is like 30 some pounds. I said, well, what we're going to do is we're just going to go out to this community hole here. And, you know, we're going to anchor up in a spot middle of the day, like midday Oops. and we pulled up to this spot and i said i got a feeling we're gonna get a bit we're gonna break your pb today and um we had a white perch out for bait and the far right rod is i mean 20 minutes after we anchored up just folded down and um i told him grab the rod and grab it reel it in and he battled 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 i mean it wasn't like a giant giant but you know i think it was 50 some pounds like 53, 54 pounds, but that's a 20, 20 pound difference in the PB. And you know, 10 years ago, 50 pound fish is the fish of a lifetime. Yeah. And you it's know, crazy. Guys to say are like that. It's 50. crazy. To I say got that. another 50. I got, you know, I mean, but it, well, it has changed. Even when I first started, like, you know, I, I can remember my first 50. Oh, Lake of course. Lake 50 Lake is a big number to hit for a, for a blue catter because they're not. They're not easy to catch. I tell guys when you, once you get the first fifty, they start rolling. They start it starts. They start coming into the boat a little more frequently. Yeah, and then you hit your first, first one's the hardest one to get. And I've got buddies that have come on the boat with me. It's the second time they ever blow cat and they get a fifty. I'm like, don't get used to this. Don't get used to. <laughs> well, that's what I told him. I was like, he was like, man, is it this easy to to get to get fifties like that at bugs? I said, look, I'm gonna tell you right now. You know, it took me two years to get my first 50 at Bugs. <laughs> my buddy Danim will come on the boat. We got him a 50 PB. I love Let's the go. PB trips, man. And he brought his son that day. He got a PB. His son, I think, at the time was five, and he got a 34-pounder, a which for a five-year-old, man, it's crazy epic to watch a five-year-old battle of 30. I love that, man. That's it. That's it. You, yeah. you know, JTC, I watch a lot of him when, you know, he takes his son out fishing and stuff. And, you know, they're, they've got some tournaments they're getting ready to do together. And, you know, that's that's awesome, you know, being able to watch him do that and stuff. And I saw the other day where he put out a video in the backyard catching a catfish. And, you know, it's awesome watching them kids do that. Yeah. Yeah, there's really, really it. better. I, I get a kick out of my watching my friend's kids. Yeah, uh, my my son's done it a million times, and he's I still love seeing that. But when he's got a friend on the boat, my son lets them catch the biggest fish. I think it's cool because it's like something I like to do. I like yeah. to see the guy on the boat catch yeah. the biggest fishing. My buddy's like, man, I can't believe you give the rod up like that when you know it's a super sized fish. Uh, but I just I get a kick out of providing that feeling. For somebody else, uh, I agree, uh, man. And, and as somebody that is that I doesn't have their own boat, yeah. you know, that's kind of how I kind of got my start is from learning from other people and, and being able to experience 
those fish. Now, granted, most of the time I had my own gear and caught my own bait and, you know, baited my own hook and helped out with spots and everything like that. But it's still that aspect of that is how I have been, you know, allowed to to fish on, on some of the places that I have and have the opportunities that I have. And I think that when you get somebody out there, I think, like you said, once you've caught enough of those trophy class blue cats, you know, your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, 80s, you know, I think that you get, you do get more pleasure in seeing somebody that hasn't been as lucky or had the opportunities that, that you've had and to give them that opportunity and see them do battle, see them, you know, get the excitement hey, and the adrenaline that going. That feel good to give that guy the 50 when it, it, his previous fish was maybe 20. You give him that 50, and you know that's probably going to hold for a while. Yeah, and, like, and they're going to go you know, over Bobby and win. all their hey, friends Bobby about Wynn, it. Bobby Wynn, give him the PB, baby. <laughs> Let's go. And you get excited because, you know, because I think that, that part of that excitement is you relive your first fish of that caliber. And you remember the excitement that you felt in that moment. And so it's like you you can have that understanding of I understand the excitement that you're feeling. You go back to that moment with them and you get yeah. to share that moment together. Yeah. Yeah. I tell guys, man, I get just a big a kick out of an excitement out of you catching the PB. And it, it burns a memory for me. Uh oh yeah. You know, if I would have caught like for instance, here's Danimal. He came on the boat again this past November, I think. Him and his son and his girlfriend's son come down. We got them all. Peep. Everybody got PBs. Uh, I think Dan didn't. Dan, we let all the kids catch the fish. Mm -hmm. Danimal's son was seven. He got a forty-five. Upped his PB from the last time he came with us. Seven-year-old catching a forty-five. It was epic. Watch yeah, that awesome. kid reeling that fish. It was. He got so fired up. He did such a great job. Uh, I just loved watching that, and I love being a part of that. Uh, I think it's the greatest thing in blue catting for me. It's yeah. takes yeah. kids to get the PB. I mean, that's what you're always chasing. I mean, I always say I always go out there to have fun no matter what, which you have to. But in the back of your mind, every time that you put that boat in the water, every time you're wetting a line, you're chasing a PB. We all are. No matter what your PB is, you're chasing to beat it. You want to be better. What 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 do y'all guys feel that has changed the game in catfishing? What oh, what man electronics? What? It's moving so fast over the last fifteen years. It's crazy how I fast. I think electronics plays a huge part in it too. Because when you look at the yeah. technology that's out there, I mean everything from live scope to the details you can see on side scan. I mean, the, the 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 rise of side side imaging and side scan. I think the side image has probably had the biggest impact. Huge. Because yes. it allows you to not see not only what's directly under you, but you can see the structure to the side. You can see the, the what, I mean, even as detailed, if you get it dialed in and you can see the shadows, you can see which direction. Yeah. That oh, fish yeah. is basic. You you can tell how the bait is orienting to the structure, how the fish yes. is orienting to yeah. the structure and the bait. Uh, sometimes they're oriented more to the bait. Sometimes they're laying on ambush structure. You could have never have determined how they were laying on that structure, how to present your bait before. Uh, and how far away they are. I mean, you can you yeah. can say that fish is 61 feet to the to the left of me right now. If you yeah. got a reel with a line it's counter, a 35 you can put it on his head. Yeah, and if you're dragging, it's like, all right, there's one 52 feet to the right of the boat. If it goes down, it's my second planer board right. out. It's going to be yep. about two minutes before we get over the fish, and then in, and it looks to be about a 35, 40-pounder. Right. And then, and, bang. And, it's and like, Chris, the reason why I bought that up is because I've been, I've been seeing in bass fishing, okay, right. They're talking about the live scopes. They're talking about all this new technology. And what I feel that we actually have done, we've jumped and we've really got so you know advanced in our technology that now they're starting to say, okay, all this new stuff isn't fair. Okay. You know, we're starting I to mean, see it. 
you know, in tournaments. Okay, you can't use live scopes. You can't do this. I, I don't see a problem with the Jamie. I, you know, where I look at it as before, guys, you, when I was a very small child, mm -hmm. guys used cane poles to catfish. Mm -hmm. I'm yep. 49 years old. We They used cane poles. It wasn't until... I was probably 10 years old that people started using rod and reel to catch yeah. catfish. And, and then all of a sudden now there's, you know, it, it just, it rapidly progresses because yeah. back then people didn't target big catfish for, with a rod and reel. That's they targeted them just to eat. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. you used worms, chicken liver, June bugs, bread, bread whatever you had left over uh, from dinner. bugs out of the garden. Uh, Frogs, if you could catch them, crawdads from the creek. Oh, oh yeah, you know, Girl, it was fun. crawdads are dynamite, and, babe. And, and not only has the technology, far as the graphs, got advanced. I mean, you look at, you know, planer boards. You look at the tackle yeah, exactly. we use. I mean, everything now has just erupted and revolved around, you know, Troll, all kinds smart of trolling motors linked to the yeah. graph that take you along where you exactly where you want to go pilot. yes yeah you set it in drift mode set a set a course and you've got no wind and no sense of direction nothing in front of you you can put that trolling motor remote down and sit kick back watch the rods Here, here's here's something that i see from some some of the guys that don't use that stuff they say oh you guys that use that stuff take that stuff away and see how you do but they don't realize that's what in order to from. use all that stuff effectively, you got to have the base. So right. you know the base. I can always yeah. go back and fish with, uh, you know, without any of this stuff and catch oh, yeah. fish. I, oh, yeah. My success rate and consistency will go down, but I will still go kick ass. Yep. I'll still go catch fish. Uh, and I, you know, I enter these tournaments where it's, no electronics, no graph. I always do well in them. Yeah. Uh, but I've been doing it a long time. And I used, I just go back to the way we used to do it. You go, you set up on a spot, you, uh, you, you know, you, you put the clock on it. If you don't catch a fish, you move. Yeah. That's just yep. the way we used to fish. Now the graph, I remove the clock. I look at my graph. I know whether the fish are there, how they're orienting. Uh, if they're feeding, I'd already know if they're going to fight or not, depending right. on the weather. A lot of factors, but uh, I I think that's funny when guys say, "Yeah, you take all these guys fifty thousand dollars worth of stuff away, and then they can't fish." That's. <laughs> I think it. I think it comes down to also. I mean, you don't see a whole. You see some some kayak fishermen that I see using live like live scope to catfish, like kayak catfish. I think that's pretty cool to, to see it, but that really only works if you're just really, if you're suspending um, for the most part or somewhere, you know, around you. But I think the biggest thing now is, I, I mean, I, if the tournaments I fish anyway, you know, you don't really see any boats without a depth finder. Yeah. Yeah. With yeah. some I mean, sort of side scan capability. Dude, you are at a major disadvantage against oh. Someone like Jamie Dunn or somebody like Bobby Wynn with a graph, because I you can roll up to the spot, say there's either fish here or not, and 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 usually when I come off plane, I know within thirty seconds whether I'm gonna fish the spot or not. Yeah, and if I don't see what I like, I move. Now yeah. I may pick five spots before the day starts, and usually within my first three, I've found good fish, and I can yeah. fish. Without that, you would have fished the first spot for thirty minutes. You would have gone to the second spot, fished it for thirty minutes, and then by the time you make it to the third spot, you're a couple hours in from pulling anchor or whatever, and you've wasted, you've burned two hours. The graph eliminates that two hours and turns that two hours into 20 minutes. Uh, no. Well, I think there's that. And I, at least it bugs and on the Jane, there's a few spots that I have on both where even if I don't see anything there in the moment, I'm still going to, I might, I'm probably still going to spend some time there because I know that at a certain period of the day, those fish are going to move yeah. into this area. Especially at the James, because you you got to consider the tides. 
at high tide and low tide, you know, water's coming in and out of some of these bays and some of these creeks. So if I know that that bait's about to get pushed up in there, you know, with the tides rising, then, you know, then I'm going to fish it. Do, do you feel, I mean, we were talking about secrets a while ago. You know, how many more secrets do you think we've got out there? I mean, you know, we're all pretty much kind of following in that same line and almost like we're all doing the same thing pretty much. I mean, yeah. do you feel that it's just got to a certain point where, you know, okay, we're all doing the same thing. So what else is there that we can advance to start doing even more of? I would say personally, I think like from a guide standpoint, I think that the biggest thing is there's certain there's certain spots that you know guides have and some of your big heavy you know hammer tournament fishermen have. I think that's really what it comes down to. I think there's some spots that people fish, but I think that they've got there are certain areas that they don't want people to know about because they found you know a pile of fish that really might not be as pressured as other areas. Um, but I just don't, in terms of rigs and everything like that, I think that there's only so much you can do to a rig before it becomes too much. Yeah. Bobby, I got a couple secret rigs. Jamie, do they work? <laughs> they work. They work. I love it. I got guide buddies that are like, you gotta, I gotta have some, I gotta have some. The catfishing game is ever changing. There's more Absolutely. to it than guys really think uh yes a simple rig will catch them but catfish are attracted to a lot of different things mm -hmm. guys used to not think they were attracted to sound turns out that's the biggest that's the biggest sense they use almost like four to one out of any other sense it's right. sound and vibration that's what they key in on uh so guys that say oh rattles don't work that's that's crap oh yeah it work the sound of bait fish being predated works. The sound of a, a plop, a plopper that these striped bass guys use works. It draws catfish under the boat and guys are now starting to catch big fish under ploppers and under thumpers. And mm -hmm. stuff. It, 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 it's, it's amazing. Said, no, that's not, that's baloney. And there's still guys that do well. that yeah. still say that's not true, but I believe Things are changing. Uh, there, there's still a lot of room for improvement. Let's just say that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, you know, if you, if you just stop and you look, take a second, and you look at what everybody's doing, all these different rigs, all this different stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you sit there and you just study it and analyze it and stuff, I don't think really we've even hit the best part of it yet. I'd, I'd have to agree, Jamie. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the stuff that guys use that guys think are gimmicks to catch fishermen, there's actually substance behind it. Yeah. I think that a fish is attracted to flutter. Uh, I think it'll produce a strike sometimes that maybe something just sitting there might not. There's something to a catfish being like a cat. He'll attack it. If there's a little shimmer to it, if there's a little sound to it, that sounds like what's this piece of bait get, is this something that's being pr predated on? Well, I'm going to beat whoever's trying to get that because catfish are competitive in nature. Yeah. I, I'm not so, I'm like, each other and bite each other to try to get at the bait. So yeah. I, I I'm like this. I like seeing the proof in the pudding. You know what I'm saying? I, I like yeah. seeing I like seeing it. So that's something I base a lot of on a lot of stuff that myself, Chris, we all do. The proof is in the pudding. So I you know, agree. I've got a couple of my guide buddies that have been trophy cat fishermen catfishing with me this winter. And we hammered them on two rigs that I don't put on everything else. It was a specific type of rig that I know is not a common rig being used uh it's just different and yeah. uh and my buddies are like looky there looky what come off of that and it'd be our biggest two fish of the day come mm -hmm. off a certain now uh you know is that rig gonna do it every time i you know maybe not but i there's, there's a certain certain days certain rigs 
work better I think, than others. I think that there's a lot of factors in that. I think, you know, also the body of water, too. Yeah. Um, can and present bait presentate the bait itself the way I think that's present. what it's all about right there, Bobby. I think it's the presentation is what is that little extra thing doing to the bait that makes it seem like a more natural presentation? Right. Well, and there's some days that you know, I mean, you can go as detailed as, as to say there are some days where only you know the head pieces work. Some days right. the body pieces. Some days they want it filleted. Sometimes they want it live. Some so, days, like when you anchor, you go smaller on baits. Not always. And I think it depends on the time of year. It depends on the type of area. You know, the area that I'm fishing. Um. You know, I mean, if I'm targeting a flathead, generally I like to talk. I like to target flatheads with bigger live baits. I mean, that's just the nature of the way I like to fish. Um, but I've also, you know, elephants eat peanuts too, and I think like in the winter time, I do like to downsize my baits because their metabolism is a lot slower. So, what's your water temperature when you're saying you're downsizing baits? Because that's not how we roll in Texas. I wouldn't say it's always how I roll, but there have been days where you run big baits, you're not getting anything, yeah. or maybe short strikes, and you downsize, and all of a sudden you've got a 64 in the boat. I, I think some here's I'd say under I'd say under 40 what? two under degrees. 40 under well, I, I'd agree under with 42 that. degrees. Well, Chris, you gotta, I'd say under 40 here. Maybe closer to 38. Uh, yeah. But here, you, you, here's the way you, I look at it. Uh, because that's when we're catching our biggest fish. Yeah, and I always put on the buffet. So my biggest plant, this is how I set up. My biggest bait's always going to be on my outside planter board. Yeah. I use massive, giant, freaking baits. Oh, I'll run four pound freshwater I drum mean, in a heartbeat. Yes. And the damn board is like, my buddy's like, man, those things won't even spread. I'm like, it's got a big bait. Wait till that thing goes down. And so, but then I downsize everything as I come in. So Me by too. the time I'm in the center of the boat, I got maybe a fillet on those. It's, you know, I mean, it's not right. a tiny bait. Yeah. It's still like that, you know. Uh, yeah. It's just enough. But I'm also trying to eliminate fish in the teens. I'm trying to go for fish over the teens. Yeah. Uh, and Chris, this is what, this is what, you know, curiosity, you're, you know, you're talking about big baits and, and Bobby, you're talking about, you know, sometimes you like to downsize and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what, you know, keeps me so curious is listening to everybody's different techniques at yeah. different times, you know, and stuff, you know, and it's just trying to find that one technique that could work in the whole, you know, for you and, you know, for, say, Chris, in all bodies of water, that's what I myself, you know, try to find. Okay, what can work for everybody? Are you, you generally know? trying to start out with some big – you're always going big on a few. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're always going big. On, but then you also got to test the water with some smaller stuff. And if you right. start getting action on the smaller ones, when that big one gets hit and it doesn't get a fish on you really, and you might think – well, we caught big some good ones on these smaller ones. Let's switch this one out. Is that kind of how you roll? So I think it depends on the situation. If I'm pulling baits, I don't think I've ever had a, a time where I've ran all small baits unless I was, yeah, you know, low on bait and you got to conserve. Yeah. I mean, if I've got an, an ample amount of bait, I'm having at least one whole, like, whole shad, whole crappy. On whole... each side, right? You put that whole one on, you're like, all right, when that one goes down, it's a giant. Yeah, if this one goes down, it's going to be big chunkus. And, um, but, uh, like you said, I mean, all some of the other ones, I think, you know, you, you might, you mess around with it. You know what I mean? Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's just days where, so I know, for instance, Bobby, if it's a high pressure day, maybe there's a front rolling in. I'm going to downsize my bait. I'm yep. not even going to. I mean, I will still put on two giant baits. Right. But I know that everything from inside that is going to be dramatically downsized than normal. 
because right. my testing days on that are done. I already okay. know. I'm going to catch more fish off smaller baits on a day where there's wet, there's high pressure, where the fish are laying in the mud. Mm-hmm. I make short my leaders. Uh, and But I will still put those giant baits on because on those days, I've caught some of my best fish off of those huge baits. And I'm going to tell you like, right now, my favorite pressure to fish for big fish is – like 30 to 30.5. Yeah, when most of the fish are like, uh uh-uh. uh. Uh huh. You still get that super sized fish. If you get a bite, generally it's going to be, well, and, and biologically, and there's a scientific reason for that, is because the pressure does not affect big fish as much as it affects little fish because Correct. of the size of their um, swim bladder. We had Epic Catfish on. He said big fish are just better suited for high pressure. Exactly. And the biggest bad, all the giant fish, most of the giant fish that he caught over 100 pounds, which is something like 15 of them, mm-hmm. he said have all come out of deep water where most fish won't even go down that deep because it's just, and there is a lot of pressure and current and things that other fish don't, can't take. And those are the only ones that are down down there in that. Uh, but when you think about it, like, you know, we all have days where we wake up and we can tell the pressure is not. Yeah. You just wake up feeling kind of black, but it doesn't ruin your appetite. It doesn't ruin your mood. You, yeah. Your business as usual. And we're a lot bigger than these, some of these catfish. I mean, a 140 pounder, you know, that's, <laughs> there's a lot of humans that aren't 140 pounds. But, you know, when you think about like a hundred pound fish, a little pressure change is not going to affect that fish as much as it's going to affect like a five pound channel. And I think that's the reason why is when all of the other fish are dormant, if you do get a. Uh oh, there goes Bobby. <laughs> Matt Mosley, what's up, bro? Welcome in. We're going to get Matt on the Carolina Lightweights team soon. So. I can't hear you. Bobby's back. Oh, hang on. Somehow me and Jamie got knocked off. Uh oh. Hear me now? Oh, there we go. Sorry, Dale Lowe was calling me. <laughs> Bobby, how do you come Bobby. up? You wake up, you say, Hey, I'm gonna go fishing. Where do you start with your rigs, man? Do you already know what you your go to rigs are with the weather? How you how you come up with that? So I pre-tie my rig so like if you look behind me all of my every rod i have is rigged up um so after every trip i wipe down all the rods and reels i i re-oil clean and retie after every trip um that's just me it's just a confidence thing for me i have the time to do it and and it's just a confidence boost for me that knowing that every start of every trip everything is freshly tied it's clean it's ready to go i'm not going to lose a fish because of a faulty, you know, a, a fray in the line or something like that. That's hardcore, uh, bro. I just, it, it, when I have the time to do it, if I didn't have the time to do it, I wouldn't. But Dude, I think my last trip, I was, I had my head so far up my ass when I got out there. I didn't have disc weights. I'd planned on anchoring. I rigged everything up. I just didn't put the disc weights on there. I didn't have disc weights when I got out there. We just had a show about prepping. I was freaking, I had a, a, a quarter of a tank of fuel. I'm like, what is wrong with me? You know, I, I went against everything about prepping. Uh, do you prep a lot before you hit the lake? So you got everything in order. What about your boat? You check so out. I, I don't have a boat. Okay. You just, um, go with the other but guy. everything else is, is in order. Like, like I'm the kind of person that I'll call, you know, my buddy, whoever I'm fishing with, and I'm going to say, you know, we at least need to get the first spot or the general area that we want to fish in. Like I'm prepped. I load, I load my truck the night before. Do y'all this have way, a big fish season or is it just year round? Cause I see a lot of guys back East. It's February like, February is my big like, fish. February is my big fish month. Okay. That's us too. I mean, the past- not just big, but we catch a bunch of big ones in Fed. Yeah. Well, not this year. This year was a, like a heat wave in Texas. Well, totally it, screwed us. 
I think so like the past other than this year and because this year my PB to beat was was 80 uh, come February but I gave it a run for for its money in February this year but the before this year the past five Februarys I had broke my PB and coming into this year it was 80 and even in you know this February I went up to the Janes in one day and caught a 74 and a 70. Yeah, that was a great trip. I, Man. I was you on that. that was awesome. But that was one of those trips where we didn't turn on the depth finder to look to Mark Fish. We <laughs> both picked a spot each, and we said, we're just going to set up on them, and we're going to trust the spots. And we caught a, I caught my 70 in his spot, in my buddy's spot, and I caught the 74 in my spot. I've I, Some of my best trips – we fished on instinct because yeah. equipment like one day the, the, a rat had chewed my core, my, my transducer cable, mm -hmm. no transducer. I was like, well, we're going to, I mean, here's one thing pressure's off. We're just going to go fish where we can't, we ended up freaking just slaying them. Slaying them. And, yeah. You know, and then my, when I first got my boat, I didn't, I didn't have, I had just some rudimentary electronics. That right. Came. And we fished, and I told my wife, I was like, I don't, this ele these electronics are freaking useless on this boat. I'm just going to fish with instinct. And it was the first day I fished on the boat, and we just freaking slayed them. And my yep. wife was with me. And it's like, man, if it was this easy all the time, I wouldn't need all this damn money to buy. Well, I, I, think, oh, I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, the pros and cons of the, the rise of electronics and the more technology you have. Because then you can start to overthink things. You can say they're not as stacked up here as I want them to be. Yeah, right but you now. Know what? Bobby, over time, would you like to go without that? No. <laughs> well, there's other advantages to it. Like we turned on the depth finder to look at, you know, the the channel let, you know, the 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 not channel edge, the secondary channel edge um in the back in the bay in a bay to to make sure it was kind of the the, the area to, the topography was where i wanted to be not necessarily where the fish are but i think there's a lot that goes in when you see a whole bunch of big fish you mark a whole big fish on the side scan or on the down scan it just feels good to know that they're down there flathead hunter brandon ladd said he doesn't know what downsizing bait is <laughs> Uh, I'm throwing these flatheads downsizing's out the window. Yeah. The, 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 I'll throw a four pound carp in a long jam. The damn lad brothers, all they catch is big fish. They don't even know how to catch a tiny one. No. I'm trying to get on that level. <laughs> They're on a different level on those damn flatheads. There's no doubt about it. Oh, yeah. Derek says he told me jello chicken. So. Guys are like, yeah, I know Chris uses chicken nuggets. Y'all know better. Listen, I've seen some. You know what the world record was caught on? But do we really know what the world record was caught on? It's the way I look. I at. have a buddy that I fished with who was out there, and he was out there that day. Well, him and his dad were because he was young. He said it. He said the guy was using chicken. He said the guy had no business. He, how, he, how often do you use chicken, Bobby? I'll use chicken on muscle beds. Yeah, that's about the only time. But even then, I don't, I still, when guys are catching them on the muscle beds, I'm freaking hammering them up shallow. Oh, yeah. So well, I don't, I, it's not more my than one way to skin a cat. And I, and I have a lot of guys that come up to me on the lake and they're like, hey, man, I'm like, how'd y'all do? And they're like, yeah, uh, we didn't hardly get anything off Chad. We we hammered them on chicken. We got uh, we got eleven up to seven pounds. Yeah. Um. They're like, how did you do? I'm like, I caught them all on Shad. We got three forties, a fifty, and a sixty. Love it. <laughs> like, you know, they did tell. They just told me it, there's. Something too putting the right bait in front of the right fish. If you well, can't put the right bait in front of the right fish, you're just gonna. I mean, you're not gonna do it. I'm right. Gonna, well, and I think when you look at when the world record was caught, right, it was before really the rise of catfishing. You know, 
was before it got popular. So I don't think that those fish were as pressured as they are today. Do you think these fish start becoming used to a certain rig? Absolutely. So when you run the basic rig that everyone else is running, there these a lot of these, I know for a fact, a lot of the big fish that I caught have been caught before. They have oh, yeah. wounds in them. A lot. I, I I can't tell you how. Now this year was not as prevalent. Last year I caught a ton of giant fish missing an eyeball. There's only one way they. There's maybe not only one way they lose an eyeball, but for the majority, for the high percentage reason why they lose an eyeball is from a hook when they're a smaller fish. Mm -hmm. The hook goes in their mouth and it's about that big and it comes back up through the eye socket. Yep. Doesn't happen to a big fish. I've never hooked a big fish in the eyeball. It's no. not the 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 way that the hook set it's so far away from the eyeball, you'll never do it. Right. It happens when the fish is eyeball is down here by the mouth, which right. is small five pound to 10 pound fish. Yeah. Um, and they survived up to, to make it to 50, 60 pounds. Uh, yeah. So no, I I a lot of fish get caught and released uh, and survive that initial eyeball missing. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, like you said, I, I think, you know, any animal is going to learn to adapt and I think, especially a big fish, a big fish that's been around a long time, that's seen a thing or two, it's experienced a thing or two, you know, there's a reason you don't see a hundred pounder caught every day or every trip. Well, there's not a whole lot of them. I mean, even in the best, like bugs is the best fishery in the country. For a hundred pounder, I, I would say. For yeah. giant fish. Uh, right. I mean, but even that, like, I fish bugs record. every weekend. I've never now, caught a hundred. Are there pounds. other lakes that hold a world record? I have no doubt. Lake Texoma has got a fish in there. Yeah. It's super size. But when you catch a 146 pound fish, even with a 10 knot hook, it's got to be hooked perfect. It's, oh, yeah. Your line has to be perfect. Your leader needs to be perfect. The hook set net needs to be yeah. in the corner of the mouth. It it's has to be in, in the corner. Catch. With, even with a 10 out hook, 146 pounder, you won't catch it. No. It, the hook set, it, it had to have been a good hook set where it, the fish turned and ran and you cranked down on it and you got it. Yeah. Because if you catch it in the flesh or in the skin, there's no way you're bringing in a 146 pounder. It's no, not with the power. Not power. with that power. No, it'll rip it and it's gone. Yeah. So. No, I agree. I agree. So, so Bob, you you just using pretty much two or three rigs is all you pretty much use to go to rigs. So, if I'm flathead fishing, I think if I'm in, it depends on where I'm at too. I think a lot of what I do and the rigs that I'm going to use are are almost solely dependent on where I'm fishing. So if I'm up in like the Dan River, which is, you know, connected, it runs into bugs, but it, you know, real narrow, skinny, shallow river. If I'm going up there and fishing a log jam, I'm not going to be running super long leaders, you know, with a rattle. A lot of times I'll just run a little short fish finder rig, no rattle, no nothing. And I'm going to put a two and a half pound sucker out there, chuck it into that log jam, but that short oh, leader. Right up next to the log jam. Mm -hmm. But I don't. You don't size want a longer weight, leader. What you size want, weight do you use with the fish finder rig? I mean, I'll throw big baits. If I'm throwing a live bait, I love, I love to use big live baits for. If I'm fishing like log jams in the river, or even if I'm targeting flatheads in a smaller river, there's just something about knowing that. There's something about seeing that live, big bait. Yeah. They put out a lot of vibration, a lot of commotion. Exactly, it draws them in, and and I I think I'll, what guys when I tell the guys I go how big I go, they're like I can't believe you go but that big, and, but guys don't realize a fourteen like on our last trip with Jesse Campbell. Here's a good example: we had a fourteen inch bait. It was giant. It was our biggest bait. Our smallest fish of the day come off our biggest bait. We caught a 15-pound mm -hmm. channel cat. I mean, a 15-pound blue cat 
off a 14 inch bait. He yep. nailed it, smoked the whole thing. And when we got him back to the boat, the bait was gone. He hammered it that hard. Uh, and so a small fish can take a giant bait. Mm -hmm. A channel cat is notorious for that. We caught a channel cat. We had a one of them big shad that I like to use, and we had cut the tail off, and I got a picture of it. The bait was, you know, it was a 12-inch bait, and we caught like a two-and-a-half-pound channel cat on it. Brandon, Look in the corner. Does anyone know the world record for a flathead? And I know when I was a kid, the world record flathead come out of Texas. It come the out world of record life. flathead is 123, if I'm not mistaken. 123, probably out of the Mississippi River. It was the I think it was the Missouri River Basin. And it was a, it, there's a controversy behind that fish. It was caught by a crappy fisherman. But that fish died so a lot of people think that it was dying on the surface and he came up and hooked it in the mouth and that's how he was able to get it in on the crappy tackle but i wasn't there that's yeah who knows who knows it, it was a handsome story yeah who knows what the real story is yeah he's a real fisherman it's not anything what the what's written about that's right <laughs> that's right you know, my buddy, it's their story. And fish, he's got 100 pound flatheads, and uh, but they all made it back into the water alive. Yeah, 100 pound flathead is, is the is, I think, the definition of a fish of a lifetime. I think a lot of guys that catch the biggest flatheads, they don't, they're they're doing it on trot. I mean, that's why it's generally been caught, it's been on trot or noodling. Lines. Noodling, you know, there was a, a, a 99 pounder caught here in Texas noodling last summer. Yeah. Just a massive fish. Hannah Barrett. They took it off that. of the dock. They took it off its nest. Yeah. Took it back to the dock, took pictures, thinking, oh, we're being conservation friendly. But no. When you remove it off the nest, the nest dies. Right. Guys, within 48 hours, the eggs get a fungus and they're dead. Yeah. So, uh, when you, that's why you, you don't see a tournament you, you to be one of those guys that pulls them off the nest you have to swim it back down and put it back in the nest right and, and even then they've thrashed the nest and quite a few of the eggs are destroyed and are going to be eaten by carp and channel catfish who are hanging out right outside the nest wait, waiting for that to happen because they're still uh let, let's be real anybody who's caught a blue cat or a flathead off of a nest they're stinking son of a guns and they're yes, they right out there waiting on on it uh they <laughs> i'm not even going to tell you what they smell like but it, it <laughs> it's not good it ain't good <laughs> well you don't want one in your if you get one in your boat during the spawn you want to get that sucker out of the boat as quickly as possible they're not yeah. going to be hugging it for pictures it's like <laughs> It's time to go. It yeah. smells like Nuevo Laredo, Boys Town, Mexico. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Love it. Uh, oh. I think so bad that th he's thrown up before. And that's, I have no doubt. Brandon, oh, yeah. I have no doubt. They will make, it, it is the nastiest, sourest stench. Oh, yeah. They'll make you throw up. Absolutely. So we're talking about unity. What did you see at CatCon that was different from last year that brought the community to, that was just different? I know we <laughs> talked about it. I know that a big reason I wanted to bring you on is because of this. Yeah. So I think a lot of it just comes down to, I mean, when you look at like last year, like in particular, I can say this was at the this was actually at the Raleigh Expo, the Raleigh Bass and Saltwater Fishing Expo. And there was a guy who came up to me and he had a Mad Catch jersey on because I was working at the Catch the Fever booth. And uh, I, he was kind of being kind of standoffish. And I kind of walked up and I said, you know, hey, is there anything I can help you with? And he was like, you guys aren't going to be mad at me for being over here. And it was kind of like, 
you know, I just couldn't really fathom the understand the question. And it was like, it is, is, is it, it, are people worried about talking or being around somebody else because of, you know, gear or apparel? And I think that this year it was, I mean, there were people holding five different, there were people buying rods from five different booths. And everybody, it was just, everybody was interacting with each other, just positive vibes. And I think that's really showing how much that we're getting, you know, really close, a lot closer now to just that we're, we're all friends here. We've got the same goal, the same passion, you know, we're catching the same, we're targeting the same species of fish in the same bodies of waters and i think a lot of people now i think it's just it's awesome to see everybody coming together and and more vendors every year i think it shows growth and unity because we're all you know we're all coming together to support each other now and i think that's huge it's huge i think last year there was a lot of guys that were afraid to go over to the other guy's booth. Mm -hmm. I saw that. I saw it firsthand. Oh, me too. I, uh, got uh, like, damn, you know, I, Hey, I know that guy. Oh, you know, but this year, uh, I think it was completely different. I, yeah. I think uh, the industry's kind of moved on. Uh, there's still going to be some of that at the low end. Uh, oh yeah. When anytime somebody new comes in and I think that's probably, what happened with some of, like, for instance, the Rod Wars? Uh, yeah. You know, I think a new guy comes in, starts doing well. It's, it's, there's animosity because yep. there's competition, you know, and there, and, but I think the catfish uh, industry has grown so freaking much. That's, that the there's so much room now uh, that, there's really, uh, it's not a whole lot of competition because there's new guys coming in every day. Yep. And, new and companies, new, new anglers. There's, I think that when you look at the growth, I mean, even in the last two years and, and how like the Saturday last year, which was the busy day last year was, wasn't even half as busy as the Friday this year. Yeah. yeah. And I think when you look at the growth and the, the number of companies, like I said, and the number of new anglers coming in and, and and everybody's coming together, I think the more you get that, the more you're going to see people coming together. Things, you know, uh, there's going to be guys that come on and fail because that's just the nature of it. It's not yeah. easy to make a living in the tackle industry. I'm sure but Jamie specifically can catfish first firsthand. Um, it's t it's tough it's a tough road to haul uh, yeah it, and, and when you first start out there's just so much competition between the different guys the guys knocking you uh, but i think if you can survive for two years uh you know things change i see a lot more guys like this year out you know i'm mad cats you're catch the fever yeah I went over to the catch the fever booth. I wouldn't have done that last year because right. I was be nervous that it would upset the flock. Right. You know? uh, and this year it's like everybody, I, it was just different. All I can say is this is different. It's a different vibe. And I, and we all know as human beings, we can, we sense vibes. We can tell when there's tension in the, in, in the room, we can tell when, you know, there's a time and place for everything. And maybe this just doesn't feel like the right time. And I think now it's just, it's always the right time. Like, I think now we're all getting to a point where we're like, I'm going to talk to whoever I want to talk to. I see it like this, Bobby. I think that the, the industry has become more professional. Yes. Um, it's, it's taken a more professional turn instead of, uh, before it was very, I, I don't know. There's just a whole different segment of guys coming in yeah. and if it's going to do well. It's going to have to go the professional route. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Everybody needs to act like a pro. Uh, if you act like a rookie or act like an a-hole, 
it's not good for any, I mean, it's not good for you. It's not good for the guy coming in. Um, you're setting a bad example. So I, I believe a lot of these companies have decided, well, if we're going to do this, we need to have a more professional manner. And they kind of, uh, you know, focus more on, on doing it the right way. And, and guys are taking, uh, a notice to that and they're trying right. to be more professional uh, well and i think the standards are changing too because you know with the rise of all of these new companies come more opportunities for people to get a pro staff affiliate brand ambassador position with some of these companies and a lot of these companies you know with standards you know because you know these anglers that you bring on your team are representatives of you know, the kind of people that you are, you know, supporting. So I think a lot of people now are realizing, well, if I want to grow in the industry, I want, I want to be respected. Yeah. I want to be, and you don't want to alienate a certain segment. Right. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're an a-hole, a lot of guys are going to be like, screw that. I ain't going to be. I'm and people gonna... talk, company owners right. talk and they say, Hey, have you heard of this person? There's, There's no uh, you doubt know, about that they're looking for a position on the team. I just want to make sure that, you know, if somebody's heard of them, I'd like to get an insight on who they a lot are. Of the guys, I re a lot of the brands I rep, they ask me, what about this guy? Well, what right. about this guy? Okay. Well, Texas is our, you know, guys don't realize Texas probably Texas sells more catfishing gear than any other state. There's so many people here. Uh, right. Guys like we got to get more, uh, you know, active in Texas. So they ask who's the professional, you know, who's the guys that act professional, like they've been there. And, and, you know, I well, think at the end of the day, that's the way the industry is headed. It's, right. If it's going to move forward, it's got to be done in a professional manner. Yeah. Uh, it's like the bass industry has done. They don't have a bunch of a-holes representing. They don't have a bunch of guys that, uh, have weird, uh, I don't know, sexual shit because there's kids that are involved in all right. that stuff. And exactly. And and if you want, you want to show these, especially you talk about the kids and, and bringing new people in, you want them to enjoy the industry. You want them to fall in love with the catching of the fish, but also the industry itself. And the I people think that, involved. That might be a reason why some of the dads didn't bring their kids in before. And mm -hmm. now there is a place for kids in the catfishing industry. Absolutely. Before it was a nasty place where you're like, I don't really want my son involved in some of this. Oh, stuff. yeah. But now it's clean. There are brands that are professional that are out there trying to lead a positive example. Uh, and you know, I, I got an eight year old. I know. I mean, trust me, I'm in it thick. So to me, it's just super important. And that's one of the things that guys that approach me say a lot is they want to be, they, if they're going to use a brand, they want to be with a company that carries themselves in a professional manner that has a family type of atmosphere. Right. And <laughs> Chris, I, I've got one question I want to ask you guys. And it's been, I've been seeing a lot of it here lately. All these people wanting to be pro staff, wanting to be affiliated, you know, wanting to be a part of something, but yet, and I've heard it all over social media, but yet doesn't never use the brand, never have used the brand. I, what What's your ooh. feedback on stuff like this? I, okay. I I'm going to let Bobby go first, but I got a lot of experience in this and I yeah. can't wait to t give my two cents on it. So I talk to guys every freaking day trying to get on the team. So one thing that I've always said is, is like for me, for example, if I'm not, if I don't have experience using the product, if, then I, I can't believe in the product. I can't wholeheartedly tell somebody else hey, this product works. If I don't use it, if I don't have experience, I can't explain to them why it works. I can't explain to them why it's a great product. 
and I think that when you look at, you know, I'm not gonna obviously say any name, but if if you're if there's people out there that just want to be on a team for the label, that's to me is not a good it's not a good fit for a brand because a, nobody knows you're just coming out of the woodworks. But Bobby, they will not be able to keep their momentum going if that's what they're doing. It for. No. And, you and can't at the do end it. of the day, like a, a brand is somebody like, maybe not, you know, you've got to at least have been heard of. You want somebody that's already showing support that uses the products that, that, believes in the products because when you can tell when somebody's lying right you can tell when somebody is talking out of their you know their rear end doesn't know what they're talking about but somebody that uses and believes in the product can explain the features it can explain what separates it apart can explain why they why it works and you can hear the genuine the the genuine i don't know if this is a word but genuineness in their in their tone, and if you don't have that, people are going to catch on and go. Do you, do you even know what you're talking about? But that's just my two cents. I feel like you have to use and and believe in the product in order to represent it. To the I would extent. agree. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you, I can't believe it. The people that even ask, I'm gonna be I, hey. I can. I, I'm freaking, I, I've got a unique position uh, because I'm team leader. I'm on a right. bunch of different teams. I have a good insight on how this thing works. I, the way that I look at it is if a guy wants on a team, number one, you need to be using the product. Yeah. If you think you're going to get on the team uh, because you're, you're not a NASCAR driver. We're cat fishermen. Uh, you're not grand champion, world champion of catfish, Mr. USA, because there's no title of that. <laughs> Even the top level guides uh, have to pay their dues. And, and I mean, mm -hmm. the top level tournament anglers are not making a living being tournament, tournament, uh, tournament anglers at this stage. No. In catfish. We are not bass fishermen. Uh, this is not, I mean, we're breaking into the professional side of it, yes. But you have to, first of all, use the products that you like. Yep. You don't use the products that you think you want to get a sponsorship for. You use what you like. And you fish often. You fish hard. And you share your journey with, along the way. And in doing so, you tell people about the products that work for you. Exactly. And that's basically how catfishing pro staff and sponsored angler works. Uh, I'm on what I consider some of the best teams in mm -hmm. the entire industry. Yeah. And the way that I got on them is because I go out and fish every week. I fish hard. I fish often. I shine the spotlight on the products that I love to use. I don't use a product that I don't like. Um, so it's easy for me. That's the yeah. way I started doing it. And when you do it that way, the companies ask you. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, yeah. And if you want to be on a team, use the product. Fish hard with it. And then give the glory, shine the spotlight on the company that you're trying to get on the team with. And, and you'll be on the team. It's, I mean... I, I, I can tell you this. All right, bro. Yes. <laughs> I, I can tell you this. There's a lot of short-lived staff out there. I can promise you. Oh, yeah. These guys, these guys come in, you know, balls to the wall. Next thing you know, done. Yeah. Don't hear nothing from them. Plain and simple. That's the, that's the style that it's just blowed up out there here lately. You know, it's just gone crazy because, like I said, the texts, the the messages, I mean, just constant. Jamie, I know, because you're sending them to me. Right? <laughs> he said. <laughs> but, you know. No, we got I, I had some guys today, and I'm like, I already know who you are, buddy. I've got one. I, I, it's like, 
I was like, I know you're a great fisherman, but to uh, get the products, use the products, mm -hmm. promote the products that you like. If you don't like what we're doing, then you know, don't promote them. But if you like what we're doing, you're going to get along with the same types of guys that we've already got. Uh, it's uh, we're very like minded type dudes. It's more of a, I like the teams that are more like a family, you rather have than to. just a sponsor. I've got teams that are sp that just sponsor us, and they're like, "Here you go, just use our crap, keep promoting." But I've got teams that are that ha taken more of an interest in me and my son. Really, it's about my son at this point, but an interest in me and my son, and I put more value in those. Uh, types of relationships than I do just yeah. somebody giving me some stuff because I'm promoting them because I feel yeah. like they're they're investing in me as much as I invest in them. And, and you hit the nail on the mutual. head. It's a mutual benefit they yeah. get from me, and I get from them. I got got I I hear a lot of guys say, "Yeah, they're just freaking using you." I'm like, "Using me for what?" I mean, I'm getting a bunch of good stuff, and all I do is try to be a good promoter for them right well and i think that goes a long ways is so like you know obviously not having a boat you know coming in to try and make an i don't want to say try and make a name for yourself but try and do the best i can and integrate myself into the industry you know there was a there was there was a lot of um The word I'm looking for is I had a lot of, I guess the easy way to say it is I had a lot of people that, you know, tried it to downgrade what, you know, some of the accomplishments, I guess, or down what I've done. That's guys that are down, not yeah. doing it. Right. You've got no, to realize but, that there's guys that when they see other people doing well, that it makes them feel bad. Now, uh, you know, it just comes with the territory of being successful yeah. in any, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. If you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you're a fisherman, if you're a sports figure, it's going to be the same regardless, whatever field you're in. Uh, well, and I think that's where, you know, like the, the 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 companies that I have, so like you know, I talk about Caleb, a lot, you know, with 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 Catch the Fever and how I got integrated with him. And I told this story, um, you know, when I and it's no secret here, year, and the reason I have such a hatred for pay legs is because years and years ago I got sucked in and didn't know, and when I found out, you know, how bad they were. I wanted to get away and learn the big water and, and get integrated and learn how I can, you know, what I can do to stop these things and, you know, shut them down. But, you know, I wanted to book a trip with Zap Royce to learn. Yeah. That's how I learned a planner board nine years ago, man. Yeah. yeah. And, and Zach, nobody would. Book he, it was before he caught his two state records. And I just lucked into it because my buddy moved up there from Texas and he's like, yeah, I live by this lake, and uh, they catch some big fish out of it. And I went and got on a guide trip, learned how to plan your board, and then a year later, he catches two state records in the same day. And so you went out with that. boarding king. <laughs> it's like, man, I got a, I got ahead of a year ahead of the jump start, you know? Yeah. You no, know, but so there was a time where, you know, I had posted on Facebook. And I was like, you know, who wants to go on, you know, book a trip with Zach Royce with me? And, you know, everybody was like, yeah, yeah. But nobody wanted to fork over their half of the the trip because, you know, it's not a, it wasn't a cheap trip. And um, never heard of Caleb before. Never heard of Catch the Fever. And this guy, Caleb Page, commented on my post and said, hey, shoot me a message. So I shot him a message and he said, hey, call me. So I called him and he again, he didn't even tell me like owner of Catch the Fever. He just, hey, he said, hey. I'm a fellow angler here, you know, you let me know when you want to go. And he said, well, we'll make it happen. And, and we went out there and I'm like, and I start, and I asked Zach, I'm like, who is this Caleb Page guy? That's just forking over, you know, 250, $300 to 
you know, with somebody he's never met. And, um, you know, I, and I think but, that's the new school catfishing. Yeah. You're willing to fork it out and just. And that's, a good and that's what it was. He didn't want to talk about the business. He didn't want to talk about the rods. He, Because every time I would bring it up, because I did my research, I'm like, you know, let's talk about this, this, and this. And he was pretty much just like, you know, if you like the rods, you know, or you're more than welcome to use them. But he said, I'm just out here as an angler and, you know, a fellow angler and a friend. And we're just going to be out here to have a good time. Man, me and Zach and Caleb... We put in at like 7 a.m. and we didn't get off the water until like 11.30 that evening. We were just having a great time. But it was just like when nobody else would, you know, would help me and, you know, fork over that kind of money. This person I'd never met, you know, was willing to help out. And I think that's what you're seeing. To your point, you're seeing that so much more now in the industry where the support is there, like, you know, the support is there if it's if it's mutual. You know what like, I mean? When I see guys like you, Bobby, you seem like a natural. Uh, as far as, well, obviously, we all love catfishing. Right. But the promotional side, you just seem like it just, it's just part of, it's ingrained in just kind of how you present your fishing uh, journey. And I think uh, guys that are really, that are, pretty good at pro staff and all that. It's just part of what they do. And Facebook users said, if you're always talking about products and trying to be a pro team, will fishing still be fun as it would be more like a job? And a I would question you, before you become pro staff, it seems like it's very easy. And, uh, you know, I do see a lot of guys like trying way too hard to get on the team. Mm -hmm. they, they 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 share out every advertisement uh, and they just try to kiss so much ass it's just not genuine right and, and I believe the the fastest route to getting on a team is to fish hard, fish often, share your journey. And throughout sharing your journey, you shine the spotlight on the products that you love and trust. If you do those four things, you don't have to share out a single post about an advertisement. You don't have to share out anybody else's things. You do it through your fishing. And if that's not fun, then you're not cut out for pro staff. I think if, if at least in my opinion... If it feels like work, then, you know, it, it's not fun. You're right. I agree. And, you know, get it, once you get on, first get on pro staff, you will feel pressure. Oh, yeah. Because there's other anglers that are on staff stuff. that are kicking ass, and you're like, damn it, I need to do something uh, to show my worth. But, you know, over time – you should you should pr pretty much feel confident in the angler that you are for getting on in the first place. Yeah. If you don't have that confidence when you get on there that you're a, really a top level angler, then it will eat you up. Uh, but fishing's supposed to be fun, and if that stuff is eating you up, you really probably shouldn't be uh, trying to promote brands because there is a certain level. I will say there is a certain level of expectation of you going out and doing it. If you're not going out and doing it, you probably shouldn't be trying to get on pro staff and you need to be fairly consistent or it will chew your ass up and make you yeah. feel bad when everybody else is doing something. You're not. Well, and I think there's also, so like the, I think that there's a lot of different styles of it because there's people that, catch big you know real big fish but they don't have the best social media skills or promoting skills but people know who they are and they know they catch big fish and to some extent you know there's certain places for that but i think with the rise of social media you know if you look at you know there's a lot of um 
you know, social media stars out there that might not catch the biggest fish. I don't think you, I tell guys, you don't have to be the best fisherman in the world. But if you, you don't can have sell to a product the, and use a product, you don't have to be catching the biggest fish in the world. What you got to be doing is being consistently going out there and doing it and showing people what you're doing. I mean, it's, just, use it's about sharing the, your, your, journey down the road of catfish it doesn't matter if you're fishing alabama with 100 pounders or you know colorado with 25 pounders uh you right. know if you're out there sharing your journey and you're out there doing it that's what gets you on these teams um, shannon oxner says i get that i promote free for mad cats just because that's what i love uh or set up from a a and b and that's it you know, you know, you promote what you love, and and I, that's basically how I got on every team. Did I ever expect to get on any of them? I had no idea that this would would work out, and I am fortunate to have a little kid that freaking hammers giant fish, so I get it. Teams want to have my son on the team, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, to me that's a bonus, and yeah, I don't think of it as a negative thing, and uh, you know, just do you and have fun doing it. And if it works out and you get a promotion uh, or get some type of sponsorship, then that's a good thing. And if not, then don't worry about it. You know, yeah. just keep fishing just because a certain brand doesn't give you half your stuff for free or all your stuff for free. Doesn't mean you need to jump brands because that won't work either. I can promise you. Yeah. Start jumping around to a bunch of brands trying to get sponsorship. And nobody gonna end up wanting you. You know, people want loyalty. So you use hit the you nail on the head. Use what you love, promote what you love, and over time, if you're consistently doing it, you'll get on the team. And if not, then just have fun fishing. Yeah. If you can't go out there and no matter what the situation is, if the if fishing isn't your peace and your happy place. And you're not going out there just for the sake of enjoying a day on the water with the chance of catching a big fish. Then, I mean, it's no longer a hobby. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what are we out here for to do this for anyone? No one's making a living doing it. Even, yeah. even the Fountain Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, they are. They're, they're close. They're probably pretty as close as anybody, but they're the best two fishermen in the planet and they you know they're still working regular jobs yeah. so I mean, yeah, I mean like you can look at guiding and that's about there's a few full-time guides out there exactly well, but even the guide you know they need to have the guys that i know that do well have four or five boats other guides guiding for them yeah uh, if you're just a one-man show i mean you can make a living doing it but you're not gonna be like just destroying it i mean you know yeah. it's, it's it, the catfish industry is not the bass industry now maybe it's headed that way i actually could see catfishing at growing exponentially to 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 the level of catfishing at some point because who doesn't want to catch the biggest fish in the lake uh, yeah you know i think it's going to come down to i mean and and we talked about it i think you need, like, you look at the bass tournaments and they'll have, like, Chevrolet dealerships or, you know, these these non-fishing, um, these non-fishing. Derek Wilson says, I'm terrible with social media, but I have fun. I'm pretty sure Bobby was <laughs> Hey, you know what? Fun is the really the main, well, for me, making memories is probably you got to make memories. The memories made through catfishing are unparalleled in life. Yeah, I can remember a lot of stuff in life, but my best fishing trips, they're like burnt into my, you know, oh, they're ingrained car. forever. It's there forever. Uh, and well, and I think that's the big thing is is being able to go out there and, you know, like when I'm stressed. I go fishing when I'm happy. I go fishing 
there's always a reason to go fishing, no matter what your mood is, no matter what you got going on. Well, to me, like I tell you guys, fishing is life. So it doesn't matter if you're feeling bad, go fishing. If you're feeling good, go fishing. If you need to figure some shit out, go fishing. Yep. You know, uh, it's just go fishing. It, it has a way of of uh, resolving whatever's going on in your life, or t at least taking your mind off of it. Uh, right. And I think that's, you know, like you said, we're not out here to, we're not out here making a living catfishing. We're, we're going out there because it's what we love to do. And, you know, if you don't love, if you don't love your hobby, then it's not a hobby. Well, I, I want to say Chris and everybody, I want to say I, I appreciate everybody that supports us here at CFW. I really do, man. It means a lot. And we've seen that since we've been on the road. Uh, we're seeing it more. Um, we're actually uh, the only drifting weight company here at this show, uh, I believe, besides, uh, you know, what tackle banding them. But, yeah. you know, everybody else is bass fishing and stuff like that. So we're ready for it, man. Uh, Jamie, seen... Let me tell you, buddy, I got a real freaking uh, inside track on all this Carolina lightweight stuff being team leader. I know you direct a lot of these guys in my direction. The yep. one thing that I hear is that that is probably the coolest thing about Carolina Lightweights is that Carolina <laughs> Lightweights is a family type thing that's yep. kid friendly, family oriented. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, I, I'm super proud of that because I feel like I feel like uh, that's what y'all are about. That's uh, what you've allowed me to build the teams around. I think that uh, that's the way the catfish industry should be designed is towards the kids, uh, uh, towards the future, where it's yeah. heading, not where it was five years ago or, you know, where it's going. Let's try to figure out what needs to be done to grow it to the next. I, I, I can tell you myself and Rebecca, we're going to hit the road. We've already started. We're going to continue growing this thing. And like I said, the tremendous support that we get for all these shows and stuff has been tremendous. I mean, it has been just crazy. So we're going to put it in there, man. Everybody's going to know about us. I can promise you. I think everybody knows who Carolina Lakeweights is, Jamie. Uh, you know, the, the way that I look at it, re Carolina Lakeweights represents a quality uh, that's pretty much – at the top it, you're not going to have an inferior product the number one thing i think that's cool Two, the family and the kids uh, y'all y'all have killed it as far as being a family type of organization company top notch bro you're nailing it and, and but the kids stuff really i think in the industry is unmatched as the way that you guys have put forth the effort to bring the kids along, to give the kids the shine, to allow us to do the Kid of the Week awards. Uh, there's really nothing like it. Uh, we got a big pr pro staff for kids. Uh, I think it's super cool, man. And that's, and it. I, that's probably my most proud part of it. I love having JT Catfish Kid. I love having Flathead Luke. I love, I, you know, I love I love Wyatt. Uh, yep. Yeah, we got more coming up through your ranks. We got JTC, his son's coming up through your ranks. I'd love to get JTC's kid on, you know. And yep. guys, like, what do y'all do? I, what do you get out of that? I'm like, we get to feel good because right. the next generation's coming up through it. Right. That's it. You now, know? I, I wanted, I wanted to say that before we ended tonight and stuff. I want to just say, you know, thank you for myself, Rebecca, and all of us. That's for sure. Yeah. I think it's awesome what, you know, what you guys are doing and, um, you know, and, and really giving, you know, in even this podcast, you know what I mean? Even this, this stream of, of getting on here and, and allowing, you know, a lot of us to share our story and our, our perspective on the industry and, and, you know, and really just be able to have these talks. And I think that, you know, we, we are all proud, we're, you know, both of us. We're both proud of the products that we use and the products that we promote. Um, 
I think there's a lot of great products. There are. I think there's a ton of great products. You have yeah. to be, you have to have a good product to be competitive in this industry. Yeah. There's no, there's no right. <laughs> I mean, there are some wrong ways in the industry. <laughs> there's no super right way. None of us has figured this thing out yet. No. But I do see a lot of us uh, similar nature guys coming together. And, and I feel like, uh, the catfish industry is going to explode here in the next five years. It's if blown up already, but the, uh, you know, where it can go, I think is uh, really exciting to be a part of uh, the catfish industry right now, getting to see the growth that's happened in the last 15 years. It's, it's crazy. Uh, and, Sky's the limit. It's exciting, and I, you know, getting to be friends with so many cool guys. Um, guys are very open to be friendly. Uh, I think we're very similar natured. Bobby, mm -hmm. you're just like me, man. I mean, we're brothers. Absolutely, Jamie, you're just like me, man. We're brothers. All three of us, very similar natured. We yeah. go fishing. We wouldn't have a, a negative thing to say the whole day. Now no, there no, are no. some guys that probably need to do some uh, to learn. Uh, in the industry about being, you know, open and friendly. Uh, yeah. There's still some of that that has to be ironed out, but I, I see the leaders have taken a better role in, yeah. In uh, trying to promote the entire industry. That's it. Look who yeah. we got here. Let's go. What's going What's on, up, buddy? buddy? Somebody got out of his bath. Come on in here. <laughs> oh, my bed. <laughs> What's going on, buddy? <laughs> What's up, buddy? Who here? Who's here? Who's this look, guy? Look at that. The legend. <laughs> what do you say, buddy? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I got in trouble school today. <laughs> oh, come oh, on, man. man. <laughs> we won't go into that, will we? <laughs> oh. Yeah. This is my boy, Action Jackson. So anybody that doesn't know, this is why I fish. So you outfish your dad. Yeah, he does. I'm I'm the net man. I should have worn the net man hat tonight, but the net man. <laughs> What's your PB? What's your biggest fish? Eighty pounds. That's what I'm talking about. It's a giant. What's What's your biggest fish this year? Sixty. 65. 65. That's a big one. That's nice, nice, buddy. I won $500. Yeah. <laughs> I bet I, that felt good. I won $1,000 the past two years. Past year. Past year. Let, oh, look that boy's been racking up. That's the that. story. Good job, buddy. Good hey, job, buddy. buddy. Love you, man. Oh. But yeah, guys, if y'all are in Alabama, come by to the Alabama uh, Fishing Expo here in Gaston. Check us out. CLW's in the house out here, so definitely come by and uh, shake our hands uh, and uh, check us out. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, uh, let's see. Eagle Eyes Tina said, I'm in Texas. I'm constantly talking about the guys at the ramp. And they ask about drifting weights. I'll pull up CLW weights for them and talk about the good people y'all are. That's awesome. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much, brother. And we that's, appreciate that's that. That's really what it's all about. You know, you, you talk about the people that you, that the stuff that you use, the stuff that you like. It doesn't matter whether you're catch the fever, mag cats, uh, Carolina lake weights, you know. If you like what you use, tell people that you like it. And uh, there's plenty of room for growth in the industry. And that's how we're going to keep doing it. That's it. That's and it. And I think also, I mean, just kind of talking about the unity of, you know, where everybody kind of working together to, to establish this common goal, you know, of, of, really getting this industry to explode if we when if we all work together and it, it's going to create an explosion within the industry yeah. and yeah now that we're seeing that right you're seeing the vibe change at catcon and look at how much 
more foot traffic there was this year compared to last year. And it's only going to get better from here as more and more feel, people feel comfortable integrating themselves into this industry. The more it's going to grow, the more other companies are going to look and go, you know what, I will sponsor that tournament. I will give them $50,000 towards yeah. first place. You know, you look at, you know, we've got tournaments now with, you know, what is that? The MRM Big Bucks, Mississippi River Monster Big Bucks or whatever it is. Mega bucks or whatever it is, a hundred thousand dollars for first place. That bass fishing kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> you let me win that, I could. I, I'll go to one tournament a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, bass fishing. The way that bass fishing works is these brands pay their way. Yep. You get a a salary, which is. What get paid to show up to it? Three hundred thousand dollars a year. Plus, they pay your tournament fees, travel fees. Catfishing's not there yet, but it is to a point where some of the very best guys can probably quit their job if uh, because uh, you got to win. <laughs> you got to win. <laughs> you got to win. Uh, you look at Kevin last, Van Dam. The, I, I can the, tell you, you could not. You money, could not he's also getting a check. Yeah, from the companies, and I don't, you know, catfishing's not there yet. No, but I can, I can tell you there, but you, you can't take your foot off the gas, so you got to keep on pushing. Yeah, you can't be complacent. Complacency kills no. success. That's it. Don't get too comfortable with where you're at. If you want to grow and do better, then do it. That's it. Love to see companies to come together and eat regulations on catfish in North Carolina. Regulations need to be probably tightened around the country. Yeah. Uh, the the problem is, uh, I, you know, they're it, on the invasive species list. It, it, one is the invasive invasive species list, but one is is the uh, the old school way of fishing. And guys buy license, and a lot of these states fish and wildlife programs are funded by fishing license. So guys yep. that are jugging, keeping big fish. They have a say in the matter. Now, until enough guys are paying in to the system <laughs> that want to release all the big fish, uh, you know, until it becomes a money-making thing, then it will never change. But right now, I believe it's a dying deal where the, there's fewer and fewer juggers every year. There's more guys wanting to, to release the big fish. There's a ton of money coming into the industry for guys wanting to preserve the big fish as that expands. And as our kids grow up and they turn the big fish loose, things are going to change, but it, it happens so slow. Bass yeah. fishing in the eighties, everybody kept fish. Yep. All of a sudden Bill dance comes out. All of a sudden Jimmy Houston comes Jimmy out. Houston. It takes about a 20 year span to get that turned around and look where it is today. Nobody, I mean, only guys keeping bass are guys that are catfishing. <laughs> You're not wrong there. <laughs> a bass fisherman doesn't keep them, which I mean, let's be real. You can go on any stretch of shore and catch a bass. Uh, catfishing yeah. or apex predators, there's just not as many apex predators in a fishery as there are. Well, maybe channel cats, but no. Yeah. That's the way I look at it. It's changing. It's going to keep changing. It's going to change over a slow period of time. I just, I see in a lot of areas where hoop nets and commercial fishing's allowed. That's the first thing that's got to happen. Set. Here in Texas, they've outlawed all that and it's turning around. Now, will we start producing 100-pound fish again? I don't know. I mean, that was 20 years ago that we were doing that. Uh, will it happen again? We may get there. Enough guys start loving, you know, big fish. It might happen. But other than that, if I want to catch one over 100, I'm going to have to come fish with Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> hey. I'm still looking for one too. 
Well, you're in the right area because it seemed like there's a bunch coming out of bugs. There was a there was a 93 and a 90 caught in a one week span up here, uh, actually in the past week. Why do they get so big there? So the way Kerr Lake is, so Kerr Lake and Lake Gaston are both originally they were it was all the Roanoke River, um, and then it would split off into the Dan River and the Stanton River on on the other side of Bugs. So with Bugs, you've got two things going for you. You don't have a lot of current or any current really for that matter because they dammed it up you might have a little bit of current up there if there's you know a lot of water coming out of the dam of the stan river but you've got enough moving water like under you know underwater not like current but good flow good oxygen coming in from three you know from three rivers really you've got the roanoke the dan and the stan river it's a big big body of water with lots of creeks lots of structure um, there's m so many species of bait fish out there, um, and there's no commercial fishing out there. So I think you've got a lot of things going for you of like, there's a lot of big fish that's caught out of Lake Gaston too. Lake Gaston yeah. produces a lot of hundred pound fish. So I think the Roanoke, the Roanoke river system as a whole. So like my PB, my 80 came out, I came out of the Roanoke river. I've been to the Roanoke River catfishing one time and stuck at 80. It's all along that kind of stretch. So I think it, it there's a combination of factors there. I think that Bugs is the least pressured um, uh, between Gaston and, you know, Kerr, obviously. But, Gas, but Bugs is also a whole lot bigger. Yeah. And there's a lot more, you know, little finger creeks and deep, deep, you know, big creeks for these fish to hide. And I think 90% of the anglers fish 10% of the lake. So I think there's a combination of factors there of why Kerr produces big fish. But I think if you take away the current at the James, I think it wouldn't be unheard of to get a hundred pounder a day out of the James. Yeah. Without, like without James heading that way. I know. I mean, I know they've produced a hundred pounder, but they don't produce a ton of hundred no. pounders, but it seems like they, Produce a, a ton of fish that are really close to that class. So fun fact, Caleb Page uh, actually has the largest uh, catfish ever caught out of the blue cat ever caught out of the James. Um, and you'd be shocked to know it's only 111 pounds. When you think about, about, I mean, like Adam Cook, I believe has. I think he's got eight now. No. He's got five now over a hundred. Um, four of them came out of the James and, and he went to bugs one time and stuck a hundred. Um, that. So I got a buddy, Tim Scott, he's got like 15 of them. Yeah. And at one point he had a world record. He turned it loose, but without getting it certified. Right. And he catches most of them out of the Mississippi. And he says got a lot. big fish are transitional catfish. Yeah. And he goes to where he believes they are throughout the season. He thinks a hundred pounder moves up and down that Trinity a considerable distance and goes and and basically he targets hundred pounders, which is crazy to me. But that's he crazy. He really doesn't catch one under 60. Uh you know, he's fishing crazy fast current. Some He told me sometimes, I think, 10-mile-an-hour current in the Mississippi uh, when he's big fish fishing with giant freaking baits that most people don't use. And uh, Yeah. I think that fishing for giant fish, there's something different about it than catching 50-pounders, like what most of us are trying to catch. <laughs> Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he told me the size hooks and it's like uh that won't even catch most of the fish that i'm catching which i think are trophies uh right well i think that there's just a i think like with bugs i think like you see it you do see a lot of hundred pounders come out of bugs you do i don't think that there's any anybody that's gonna doubt that but, you know, it's not easy. 
Yeah, it's not easy. Uh, you have to, everything has to be upsized and everything has to be perfect to catch a big giant fish. And even guys that target big fish, uh, you know, you miss a lot of the best ones. I always tell a the guy, they're like, man, I missed this super sized fish. I'm like, big fish got tricks that you just, Every, a big fish is a, a big fish is a smart fish. Yeah. They got different tricks. And if you're not hooked up, just perfect. They rip that thing and right out of flesh. That's just, what you know. a lot of people don't realize is, you know, like in myself included, if I miss a fish and I know it's a, it's a big caliber fish and you start thinking, Oh, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Sometimes it's not even what you did wrong. So, I mean, sometimes everything it's has to go. go. Right. And I mean, there are ways to negate losing some of those big fish. If you just crank your, your, your drag down uh, considerably when you get a giant on, if he's not hooked perfectly, you might have a chance to get him if you loosen your drag. If well, you keep the drag of... tight like you need to like you need it to set the hook when he gets close to the boat, a giant if he's not hooked perfect, you'll lose it every single every time. Every time. Every yeah. time. They will rip the skin hook out, they will rip a uh you know, a whisker hook out, it's gone. The fish is gone and you'll lose it. So uh you know Guys that watch me live, they'll hear me when we get a big one on. I'm like, turn that, crank that freaking drag down. Damn. <laughs> well, see, I don't use any reels with heavy, really heavy drag. Like, I think my Cast King Rover has got, has got the heaviest drag of the catfishing reels that I have. Uh, it says it has 30 pounds of drag, but I'd like to, uh, I'd like to put that on a scale. <laughs> um, but like my Lose Laser have 11 pounds of drag, so they'll pull drag pretty easily. Um, and I don't lose a lot of fish at the boat. And I think that's attributed, you know, to that, you know, but on the other end, you know, maybe on the takedown, you know, it might pay to have some heavier drag sometimes. That's how I do it. I got my drag tightened down pretty good during the takedown. So when I crank on them, my damn reel's not spinning on a big fish. Right. I think you can sink the hook that way. But when you get that giant one to the side of the boat, if he's whisker hooked or skin hooked and he makes a run, he's gone. If you don't crank, I mean, I just learned that from my guide buddies that catch a ton of big fish. They're like, right. you know, be a man, turn that drag down manually when they get close to the boat on your best fish and you'll catch more of them. Right. And that's what I've done. And, and it's definitely worked. I it mean, it pays dividends. Yeah. It pays off on big fish because I'll get a giant in the boat. I'm like, look at that son of a bitch. He was just barely, barely hooked. Just barely hooked. And we got him. Uh, Cause that drag, that drag is what's getting him in. I mean, you can catch any fish in the lake with the right drag setting. If you know what you're doing. I mean, I watched somebody at Bugs catch a 96 pounder on six pound test while crappy fishing yeah like and right in front of me that was been out there all day throwing these monster baits this man with a little crappy minnow and six pound test and a little crappy rod catches a 96 right in front of me that's how the ball rolls but but again you play your drag right yeah you catch any fish in the lake you can catch any fish in the lake well, but, Jamie, I see you're tired. Bobby, yeah, me I too. you're tired. Y'all are an hour behind me. So, well, I don't know about Jamie. He jumped the time zone moving to yeah. Alabama. Yeah, we, we, we I'm an hour to, ahead of you. Yeah, uh, Alabama right now, I believe it's saying it's 838, but it's yeah, 24 it's hours for me. Here. <laughs> Before we go, what you guys, I know Jamie don't have fishing plans for this weekend. He's working. I'll be at Bobby's. Bobby. What do you got going on this weekend, man? <laughs> I'll be at Kerr Lake. I'll be chasing that hundred pounder once again. Go. F <laughs> Where are you going to be? I'm going to be up at Texoma. We got a big front hitting. It ain't going to be good, but no, it ain't. We're catching sitting at home. <laughs> I, I, I'm just, I'm just ready to get back fishing. <laughs> That's right. I think we're all ready to do that. And, 
That's it. Even when we're tired of it, we're ready to go again. Bobby, go follow Tim King's boat around. You might head to shoot. What's funny about that is the bait he used, I caught that bait. I gave him that bait. That's your fish. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, any extra bait I have left over when I'm up there, I always... I always, you know, see if, you know, him or any of the other people up there need it. I do the same thing, man, because yeah. I like getting bait. I like getting bait without having to, like, go get, mm -hmm. I like to have bait before I go fishing. I I will have. He's like, man, you got a lot of good friends. I'm like, man, it pay. Uh, you don't even know. Yeah. That right there is the biggest payoff in catfishing is when you got buddies that will get your bait for you. Right. Like, bef like fishing before you have to go fishing sucks. I mean, I'll do it, but I would much rather have my buddy out the day before. So, lesson right here, guys. Grow your fishing connections. Yeah. Know as many guys that are out there doing it as, as you can and use that to get your bait. Because <laughs> I mean, getting that, bait is half the battle. That's right there is half the battle. Yes, sir. But but Chris, before we get off, guys, if you're in Alabama and guests in Alabama, come check the CLW out for uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We'll Gas in Alabama, where are y'all located? We're we're next to uh, Talladega, Alabama. We're at the um the the right here at the you know center right here in Gaston. What center? What are we talking about here? Uh, where we're located is at the uh, Alabama Fish and Expo. It's all right. right uh, the name on it, uh, it's just the Expo Center is all they've got. Okay, uh, so it's the Expo Center. It's it's uh, Alabama. Where's the, yeah. what's the city? Gaston. Gaston, Alabama. Yeah. Gaston, no Alabama. Yeah. Get you some Carolina Lake weights. Awesome That's products. It. Love it. Good dude. Family oriented, kid oriented. Bobby, what do you got going on this weekend? I'm gonna be fishing and and enjoying my time that the guy that the good Lord is gonna allow me to spend on the water. I hope you nail a giant, Jamie. I hope you sell a million freaking dragging weights. Let's go. Yes, everybody. I'll be up at Texoma uh Sunday or Saturday. My son's got no sports on Saturday, so Saturday is when we're fishing. Let's go. Looks like north front hitting. We got rain Thursday, Friday, 20 degree drop Saturday. So we've got the 20 degree drop Saturday, the wind Saturday, and the rain Saturday. Yeah, yeah not a good combo for fishing. That's but hey, I always say you can catch you might a good chance of catching a giant on a day like that. We you might, might not get a lot, a lot of fish. fish, but you might catch a giant. Yeah, and uh, you can't catch them sitting on the couch. There's That's no right. doubt yeah. about that. So there's, there's I would much rather sit out there and catch one or two, maybe three good fish. Uh, one good one I'm hoping for on a day like that. So if I catch a hundred pounder, I'll go fishing every day. <laughs> That's what I'm up at Texoma for. Last time I was up there, I marked two that were 100-pound class. Oh, yeah. It's, it's our only lake that has those. Uh, and I spend a lot of time up there spring and fall. Got to do it. Hoping, man, hoping. Well, so. Good deal. All right, boys. It's been real. Appreciate, Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Spending some time with us. Bobby. You're welcome back anytime. Come man. on, you let me Gross. know, man. Yeah. I, I, I had a great, I had a great time. You I come appreciate back. I'm going to Texas. If you want to come in the hot season, we'll go catch some gator gar. Let's go. If you want to come in the winter, we'll go hammer blue cats like hardcore. Let's do it. Let's do it. When I come up there, you know who I'm calling, buddy. Come on with it. <laughs> Let's make it happen. I appreciate everything that y'all do and for having me on and. Um, man, I hope everybody gets their PB next trip. Yeah, me too, man. Appreciate you, buddy. Be good, Jamie. Appreciate you, buddy. I know you're tired. You got two hours of sleep last night, so go get you some rest. Go get geared up for the show. Hope y'all yes, kick ass, buddy. 
Yes, sir. Appreciate y'all guys, buddy. Yeah, appreciate you. Have a blast. Anybody right, needs anything from me, just holler. Uh, you know, you can find any of us on Facebook. You got to, Bobby, tell us all your, your uh, social media stuff and, and where guys can find you. Oh, man. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, just Bobby Wynn. Um, TikTok uh, at The Real Rodfather. Um, it's really about all I use. <laughs> There you go. Jamie Dunn, he's on uh, Carolina Lake Weights on Facebook. Yeah. He's we got a Facebook group, Carolina Lake Weights Facebook group. We he's on Carolina Lake Weights on YouTube. They're doing TikToks. Uh, I think they're off this week doing he's got a fishing show, but uh, go check them out. Uh, awesome products, awesome dude. Bobby, holler at me, buddy. Yes, sir. We'll definitely catch up. I'll give you a holler tomorrow morning. All right, man. Y'all be good. Appreciate, Appreciate you. Guys. Later, God, God bless. Azul out. Later. Later, y'all.